Hi there, it's Dr. Ryan, and today I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, my approach to um, optimizing thyroid hormone, and it's going to be a two-part presentation. We're just going to go through things uh, fairly quickly. It's been something that some of my patients have uh, asked about, and I've had a lot of interest uh, in, in terms of how I, I look at things. So let's go ahead and, uh, and take a look, right? So I'm going to share my screen here. And pull this up. Okay. So uh, when we start, uh, we basically want to think about the physiology of the thyroid horm of, of the thyroid in, in context of it being an endocrine organ, an endocrine system. So uh, the hypothalamus secretes a hormone called thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH. The, the hypothalamus is a piece of tissue, of course, within your brain, part of the endocrine system, and it acts upon your pituitary gland and the anterior portion, the anterior pituitary, pituitary gland, to release thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, and that in turn will act on your thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones, right? And so the crux of what thyroid hormones do is that they essentially increase metabolism. They bind to uh, thyroid hormone receptors within the nucleus of cells and increase enzymatic uh, reactions, uh, just uh, how quickly those reactions are occurring, metabolism of certain substances, they're important in growth and development, and also they are linked to increased catecholamines and uh, may in part be responsible for the fight or flight reaction. So increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, perhaps when you're being stimulated by something. Something to note though, is as, uh, as T3 levels and T4 levels get too high, there is negative feedback upon the um, pituitary. So you have less TSH secretion. And so that's kind of the way in which it controls itself. Your levels don't get too high. Now, if you were to take the um, thyroid, and here, here's your thyroid right here. So you, uh, I don't know if you've ever felt your Adam's apple. That's actually where your, your uh, thyroid cartilage is, right? And if you feel it just below there, obviously, if your thyroid's not large, it's going to be hard to feel it. But it's a really soft piece of tissue. It has two lobes here, and that's your thyroid uh, gland. And if you were to take a small section of it and put it under a microscope and blow it up a hundred times, it would look something like this. And uh, this is the histology of the, um, the thyroid. And you can see what's kind of interesting is you see these little pink puffy areas. That's those, that's thyroid follicle. And like these little uh, ring, this little ring of cells around here, those are your follicular cells. And so they're very important in terms of thyroid hormone function. So what happens is uh, iodine is actually absorbed through the bloodstream and it is entered, it enters into these uh, follicular cells and then it is um, then transported into the thyroid follicle and help to produce T3 and T4 when it binds with something called thyroid globulin. Also of note, uh, there are like these clear cells here. There, uh, you see these more purplish cells surrounding the thyroid follicle and these clearer cells here, which are parafollicular cells, uh, which release calcitonin. And calcitonin is really important in terms of maintaining appropriate um, bone integrity, right? Because it actually tends to modulate, to reduce the activity of osteoclasts so you don't tend to break down bone as much. And that's very important as well. Something that's kind of interesting is in, in the, the treatment that I tend to prefer for, uh, for optimizing thyroid hormone, and that is natural desiccated thyroid hormone, you also, there, in addition to having T3 and T4, there is T1 and T2 and T0, which are also forms of thyroid hormone that are not as functional as the others, but may, may potentially have some, but also calcitonin. So that's, that's just kind of, kind of interesting. All right, so um, this picture actually goes in much greater detail about what happens at a cellular level in the thyroid follicular cell, right? And so you can see iodines being absorbed from the blood into the thyroid follicle cell. Remember that's like the, you know, the ring of uh, cells around the follicle, right? 
and um, thyroglobulin is being secreted into the uh, colloid right here. And then iodine goes in through the pendant receptor, it gets oxidized uh, through peroxidase enzymes, and it uh, binds to these uh, ends on the, on the thyroglobulin, right? And then thy thyroglobulin is then broken apart. Uh, some of them uh, have, some of these rings are have uh, two iodine, or have, I'm um, sorry, some of the portions of the molecule have four iodine atoms, some of them have three iodine atoms, and that's important because that, uh, when they break apart, you'll see that uh, thyroxine uh, has uh, the molecule that has four iodine atoms, whereas triiodothyronine has three iodine atoms. And, and these are actually tyrosine rings, tyrosine rings. So the tyrosine rings that have four iodine iodine atoms are thyroxine, and the ones that have three iodine atoms are liothyronine or triiodothyronine, the same thing. And T3, which is triiodothyronine, another name for that, and thyroxine, which is uh, T4, another name for it, is excreted into the blood where it then go, goes ahead and acts on effector uh, cells. And so as you can see, um, this is another diagram, essentially repeating what we just talked about, right? So here you have the thyroid gland. So the T3 and T4 has been released and goes in the blood cells, right? And uh, thyroid hormone is actually carried by this other protein called thyroid binding globulin. That's how it is bound within the blood and uh, it's transported to cells that way, right? And T3 then goes into the cellular nucleus and binds to T3 receptors and increases metabolism and all the good things associated with thyroid hormone, okay? Now, uh, this complicated uh, diagram is actually not that complicated. It just kind of talks a little bit of the conversion scheme of T4, T3, reverse T3, and T2. Remember how I said that the type of thyroid hormone that I recommend has T2 uh, as well, in addition to uh, T3 and T4 and T1? Um, so there are, in the periphery, so once it's released from the thyroid gland, these thyroid hormones are converted uh, between each other. So T4, which is approximately 80% of thyroid hormone that's secreted from the thyroid gland is converted to T3 via a special type of uh, enzyme called the deiodinase, uh, D2 and D3. And um, so D2 and D3, those specific, specific types of uh, enzymes will convert T4 to T3 uh, D3 and D1 will convert T4 to reverse T3, and then D3 and D1 will uh, convert um, T3 to T2, and D2 and D1 will, will um, convert reverse T3 to T2. What's important is I also will measure reverse T3 levels. Reverse T3 actually will bind to uh, T3 receptors, but it won't have any activity. A good way to kind of think about it is like whenever, you know, if you've ever had a, um, if you've had to make a copy of a house key, and this has happened to me before, so you go like, you know, your hardware store and they make a copy of your house key and, you know, maybe the guy uh, who made the copy wasn't the most uh, knowledgeable about the machine. And then you come home and all of a sudden, you know, you'll notice that the key will fit in the lock, but it won't open the lock, uh, usually because one little notch is a, is a bit off. So imagine that T3 is your original house key. That is the one that opens your door lock. Reverse T3 will fit in the door lock, but it won't open it. So it essentially just blocks uh, uh, thyroid hormone receptors. So it'll, it'll, it'll bind there, but won't have any activity. And you don't want a lot of reverse T3. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the symptoms. Uh, so the symptoms associated with uh, hypothyroidism or, or poorly optimized uh, thyroid include things uh, just from a system standpoint, so neurologically, depression, poor mental concentration. Um, from a cardiovascular standpoint, you could uh, have poor exercise tolerance, um, you have cold extremities and tolerance to cold. From a GI standpoint, you'll have issues with constipation, 
uh, from musculoskeletal standpoint, you have edema and muscle aches along with uh, weight gain uh, owing to the decreased metabolism. And from a reproductive uh, sexual standpoint, you can have decreased libido. And so these are all things that are, that are pretty common and obviously not very pleasant. Um, what about physical signs? Well, one of the most uh, common signs is uh, myxedema, which is just kind of this swelling that's most commonly seen around uh, patients' eyes and uh, their ankles. And um, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious, and I have some pictures to, to indicate that. Keratinoderma, uh, and that's kind of where you get an accumulation of beta uh, carotene in the skin and you kind of get this orange discoloration of your palms and, and the soles of your feet. You see it in, in vegetarians and vegans a lot because they tend to eat a lot of carrots, but you can also see it in uh, patients who have hypothyroidism or poor, poor thyroid function. Um, follicular hypokeratosis or just really dry scaly skin. I tend to see it a lot on patients' elbows and forearms. Um, dry, coarse, thinning hair. Uh, pallor and maybe due to anemia. Uh, oftentimes, patients who have hypothyroidism have low iron. Uh, I, and this is important because iron is very, going back to those enzymes here, these deiodinases uh, that convert T3 to T4, or, or um, sorry, T4 to T3 and T3 to T2, um, these actually require many different uh, vitamins and supplements to operate. Uh, appropriately, iron being one of them. And so if you ha don't have enough iron in your, um, your system, you may unfortunately actually get a lot of reverse T3 formation. Okay. And then uh, here are some, so we're going back to the, the signs of uh, hypothyroidism right here, or rather the, the physical signs of them, right? And then um, you can kind, kind of see some of these things right here. So this is, this is what I referred to as myxedema underneath the eyelids. You'll see that kind of swelling underneath, underneath the um, lower eyelids right here. Um, we call it paraorbital edema. Uh, you may notice their patient's faces are, are kind of puffy, of dry hair that's coarse. And then that's that orange discoloration of the palms uh, due to excess beta carotene. Okay. So... Uh, we're going to go ahead and stop at this juncture and continue this in a, another uh, section and talk uh, next time about uh, lab considerations along with treatment modalities for uh, poor thyroid function. So I look forward to see you guys uh, at the